Good afternoon. Thank you for spending time with us today. It has been a powerful day of policy discussions on some of the most pressing issues that are impacting our nation and the Latino community. I wanna thank once again, our event host sponsor, Amazon, for their support and leadership of our Spring Policy Summit. And I wanna thank our sponsors for this closing plenary, Comcast Corporation and the Service Employees International Union, SEIU, for helping us to convene this important conversation. CHCI is proud to be a national convener of events like this, where we bring together members of Congress, policy leaders, and other stakeholders from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors throughout the country to engage in these high-level policy discussions. To kick off this session, I'm pleased to welcome back Congresswoman Nanette Diaz Barragan from the 44th District of the State of California and our CHCI Chair. Good afternoon. Thank you again to everyone who has joined us today for the CHCI Spring Policy Summit. We hope you've enjoyed the sessions and found the discussions informative. These summits are part of CHCI's mission to address the most pressing issues that impact the nation and the Latino communities. We hope to present strategies around policy and practice that lead to equitable opportunities, access, and resources to improve the quality of life for all. So far, we have addressed health, education, and technology, new developments in investing, energy and climate change, as well as COVID-19 vaccine distribution and rebuilding our workforce. I'm happy to welcome you to the discussion for our closing session, Equitable Infrastructure for American Growth. The session will look at one of the most talked about issues on the Hill and around the country, the need to update and modernize our country's infrastructure without leaving any community behind. It's important that as we put together an infrastructure plan, we look at how equitable investments in our nation's infrastructure will create opportunities for Latino communities and workers. I look forward to the conversation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker for the session, Secretary Pete Buttigieg, who is sworn in on February 3rd, 2021 as the 19th Secretary of Transportation. Prior to joining the Biden-Harris administration, Secretary Buttigieg served two terms as mayor of his hometown of South Bend, Indiana. A graduate of Harvard University and a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, Secretary Buttigieg served for seven years as an officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve, which included a deployment to Afghanistan in 2014. He made history when he became the first openly gay person confirmed to serve in a presidential cabinet. Now, he leads the administration's efforts on the American Jobs Plan to build back better. I hope you enjoy his remarks and the discussion that will follow. Welcome, Secretary Buttigieg. Hello everyone, it is an honor to be here and great to be addressing so many leaders. In 1987, the late Representative Edward Roybal, one of the founders of CHCI said, if we don't invest in the Hispanic population today, we will pay the consequences tomorrow. That truth is something you all know well. For decades, CHCI has educated, empowered, and invested in thousands of young Latinos. Today, your alumni are lawyers and public servants, activists and advocates. They shape policy at the highest levels of our government, and a remarkable number of them have been the first in their families to graduate from college. CHCI opened doors of opportunity for so many young people, and in turn, they went on to hold those doors open for the generations that followed. It's a testament to the impact of your work that so many of your alumni still volunteer and contribute their time, their money, and their wisdom to this organization. In truth, federal policy has not always invested in Latino communities the way that this organization has. And indeed, there have been consequences. This past year has been a painful reminder that institutional disinvestment in Latino communities can have devastating consequences. We've seen the numbers. Hispanics and Latinos four times more likely to be hospitalized from COVID-19 as whites and more likely to lose their lives. Latinos account for 16% of the population, but 23% of the initial job losses last year. And a net total of over 1 million Latinas and Hispanic women lost their jobs since the start of the pandemic. 
That's not acceptable. And it's an example of why racial equity is a key element of every part of this administration's agenda. Take the American Jobs Plan. It calls for $85 billion to modernize and expand our transit systems. And it doubles the federal funding for public transit, partly in the knowledge that communities of color are twice as likely to depend on transit. It invests $20 billion to reconnect neighborhoods that have been torn apart by past highway projects in the knowledge that those projects have too often ignored or even actively harmed underserved populations. It includes another $20 billion to improve road safety, fixes 20,000 miles of roads, highways, and main streets in the knowledge that black and brown pedestrians are often more likely to be killed in traffic fatalities. Beyond transportation infrastructure, the president's plan also provides for universal broadband so children everywhere can access the same educational opportunities. It replaces 100% of lead pipes, so no one has to drink unsafe water simply because of where they live. And it raises wages and benefits for care workers, workers who are disproportionately Latinas and often other women of color. Most important of all, the American Jobs Plan will create millions of good paying jobs, union jobs, most of which are available whether you have a college degree or not. And we're making sure that these jobs and these resources go to the people who will benefit the most. Across the board, 40% of the climate and clean infrastructure investments in this plan will go to underserved and overburdened communities. There are some who have had a hard time understanding that racial equity is part of transportation infrastructure. But it's a simple matter of reality. Look at air quality. In the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic region, the air contains 75% more pollutants in Latino neighborhoods than in white neighborhoods. And that is a consequence of things like the availability of public transit and the routes that highways go through, as well as other environmental justice factors. Different racial groups breathing different air. This shows up in higher rates of hospitalization and even deaths from asthma for Hispanic residents. This is an example of why clean air is a racial justice issue and why transportation policy is an equity issue. It's why the investments that we make now must be robust, they must be forward-looking, and they must reflect the inputs and the needs of every community. Thanks to the work of CHCI, Latino communities have a strong voice in this conversation. Investing in America must mean investing in Latino communities, and no one knows how to do that better than CHCI. In the coming months and years, I'm looking forward to continuing to work together to confront the challenges and seize the opportunities that await us. Thank you and keep up your great work. I want to thank our chair, uh, Nanette Diaz Barragan, for her leadership and for her remarks uh, just a few moments ago. And I want to thank you, Secretary Buttigieg, for your insightful comments, uh, for your leadership as well, and for your support uh, of uh, CHCI and of our community. Um, and by the way, for our participants watching, if you would like to continue this conversation on social media, please use the has hashtag CHCI Summit. And now I think we've sufficiently set the frame, so let's get to the discussion. We have a dynamic panel of experts and leaders representing varied industries and perspectives, but all connected to this equitable infrastructure debate. They're here today, ready to discuss the initiatives and opportunities that impact us as a community. So first off, I want to welcome to the panel and to give some welcome remarks. We have Congressman Salud Carvajal, who represents California's 24th Congressional District and is a member of CHCI's Advisory Council. How are you doing, Congressman? Good. Thank you, uh, Marcos. I appreciate the opportunity to join everyone today. Let me first uh, thank and recognize CHCI for the great work that it does day in and day out to address policy and provide so many opportunities to many of uh, young Hispanics uh, throughout the country and to make sure the Hispanic and Latino agenda is at the forefront here in Washington. I wanna commend you for your leadership. I am uh, really uh, appreciative of uh, joining such a distinguished panel uh, of uh, great people that are gonna speak uh, today as well. As you said, I represent the Central Coast of California I grew up in my early years in Arizona. My father was a miner in an underground mine. When it closed, we worked, moved to Oxnard where my father worked as a farm worker. My mother was a homemaker. She had rheumatoid arthritis, uh, couldn't work outside the home due to pain and deformed hands. 
and but she took care of us bratty kids. I was lucky enough to have gotten a great education at UCSB, joined the United States Marine Corps. Early on in my career, uh, served uh, as chief of staff to a county supervisor named Naomi Schwartz, who gave me a great opportunity and in introduction to public policy. Eventually, I served as well as a county supervisor myself, and now I'm serving in Congress. Uh, what these roles taught me uh, was the importance of making sure equity is front and center. Uh, for far too long, I've observed personally the haves and the have nots for low income minority communities. And it's a challenge to make sure that we are always uh, sounding the alarm, making sure that uh, when we make public policy, it's inclusive and equitable. Uh, and certainly when it comes to uh, infrastructure, we need to remember what that equity trans relates into. That is opportunity, that is jobs, that is broadband, accessibility, uh, making sure that equity of funding of government contracts uh, actually funnel to those communities that oftentimes are left out. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Marcos. Thank you so much for those remarks, and it can never be said too many times. Thank you for your service, both before and now in so many ways. Uh, next, let's welcome Ashley De La Torre, who's the Director of Public Policy at Amazon. Welcome, Ashley. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Marco and CHCI, for including me on this panel. Amazon's proud to sponsor this event and engage on this important conversation. I lead Amazon's transportation and sustainability public policy team. So we support the business teams who run Amazon's operations across the US, including in our first, middle, and last mile networks, and our employees that make two-day and same-day delivery possible. During the pandemic, Amaz uh, America's transportation network has been vital to allowing customers to stay safe and receive important products and services at home, especially for those at risk due to complications for from COVID-19. And we're proud of the role our employees have played to help serve these customers. Uh, in, in the past decade, Amazon has created more jobs than any other company and has invested in communities across the US. We support President Biden's goal to invest in transportation and transit infrastructure and have offered to partner with the administration to help pay for those important investments. I look forward to discussing how we are leading the expansion of broadband, driving sustainability improvements, and transportation innovation to support communities across this country. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And next, joining our panel, we have Arnulfo de la Cruz, who's the Executive Vice President of the SEIU 2015. Welcome, Arnulfo. Thank you, Marco, and thank you, CHCI and the distinguished panelists. Really happy to be a part of this incredibly important conversation. Um, I, as Executive Vice President of SEIU 2015, am fortunate to represent roughly 400,000 caregivers in California and when we think about equity and in infrastructure, maybe caregiving has not been front and center as part of the conversation in this country around those things. I'm so excited that we have this once in a generation opportunity through President Biden's American Jobs Plan to create one of the most racially diverse, resilient middle class that this country has ever seen. The majority of the caregivers that we represent are women and they're women of color. So as we think about the need to build back better, it's important that these jobs be good union jobs, right? Where workers have a real say in the standards of their work that includes uh, paid family sustaining wages. And I think really the last 12 months, what we really learned, the global pandemic really laid bare to some of the deep cracks in what essential workers, again, predominantly people of color and immigrants, face every day. We just heard from the congressman his story, but these families facing every day to keep their families and communities safe and running, uh, these essential workers have put their lives on the line, yet many of them are still paid poverty wages. They lack benefits like health care and paid sick leave, and also aren't provided basic protections and training. So I think that it's important that we recognize that preparedness and resiliency really starts with building a stable frontline workforce that's highly trained and also is paid a livable wage that allows them to sustain their families. That could be a worker cleaning the cabin of an airplane. It could be a home care worker who provides compassionate care for
for our nation's seniors or people with disabilities, but it's important that all essential workers be respected, protected, and paid. So I'm so excited to be joining this conversation today. Thank you, Marco. Great, thank you. And our fourth panelist, we're very pleased to have Mr. Leo Munoz, Executive Director of Federal Government Affairs at Comcast Corporation, who's no stranger to CHCI. Welcome, Leo. Oh, thank you, Marco, and thank you, Congressman Carvajal, and to all our panelists today. I just, uh, you know, want to say if we've learned anything through the pandemic, it's that broadband is critical uh, for all of us. If there was any question, uh, you know, a little over a year ago, there's absolutely no question now. And I can tell you, we definitely share the same goals as the president and what uh, Secretary Buttigieg outlined is that we believe every American should be connected. And we also believe that part of that is going to uh, require some sort of effort with adoption as well, which is which is one of the barriers that we have seen uh, in our decade in working with low income communities across the country uh, is is one of the probably most challenging portions of of this of the connectivity question. So we're just really honored to be here with all of you. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, so let's get into the dialogue with all of our panelists. And let, let me kick off with a question for everyone. We can just go around the circle here. Um, President Biden proposed a plan that would spend $2.3 trillion uh, uh, to help uh, address the nation's chronic infrastructure problems. And it invests in some of the traditional infrastructure needs like roads and bridges and ports and airports, uh, even water and sewage systems. But it also has other needs, right? There's other pieces that, that are put in there. There's a, there's a component about broadband. There's a component about child care. There's a component about schools. So I wonder if you could each share where you see the greatest need for this funding and or how you see this proposal intersecting with your work. In what ways might it facilitate the things you want to accomplish to help the nation move forward? And we can start maybe with Congressman Carvajal in terms of what you see, in terms of what's important. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marco. Well, first of all, uh, there's no need, there's, there is no doubt that we need to invest in our infrastructure. And the American Jobs Act provides a robust investment across the board on not just traditional infrastructure, but also schools, broadband, um, housing. It is pretty comprehensive. And we have estimated that the cost of, of $4.6 trillion is needed to bring America's infrastructure to the state of good repair by 2025. And that's according to the American Society of Engineers. There are 58 million Latinos living in the United States we make up almost 20% of our nation's population. It is vital, of course, that our communities are part of the conversation uh, around addressing our infrastructure needs and ensuring accessibility. Approximately 15 million people in the United States have difficulties accessing the transportation they need. Currently, 1.4 million older non-drivers rely on public transportation. I bet if we delve deeper, this probably impacts our communities the most. I serve on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and we are actively working towards writing our surface transportation reauthorization bill, which is a major component of this overall American jobs plan. This helps fund repairs to our roads and bridges, increases access to transit, and much more. We are also looking to ensure that this bill uh, addresses equity. Some examples of provisions included last year in the HR2 Moving Forward Act, which is the foundation of this infrastructure uh, surface component, uh, which I helped put together last year, requires the secretary to consider equity and environmental justice and whether a project is in a persistent poverty or urban poverty community under the Community Climate Investment Grant Program. It also requires the secretary to consider equity and environmental justice, uh, justice under the new active transportation and connectivity grant program, adding additional planning considerations for accessibility and equity, including a holistic look at housing and land use policies in both the statewide and metropolitan planning area. Um, in terms of local experience, uh, you know, having seen it firsthand working in local government, 
I've seen these needs firsthand. And I think the American Rescue Plan, the American Jobs Plan provides a robust investment from an equitable standpoint to make sure that the Latino community doesn't get left behind. That's great. That's Back great. You, thank Michael. you. For, uh, that's wonderful. And thank you for that, for that detail of, of many aspects of the plan. I think that's really helpful since it's, it is so big and complex. It was useful to, for you to pull out some of those parts to help really folks really understand what's in it. Let me turn to you, Arnulfo, for a minute. Um, the, the, the Congressman just mentioned transportation was one of those pieces and equity is, is a core piece. How do you see that uh, playing out in terms of the needs of workers, particularly as you mentioned, some of these workers um, uh, in industries that rely on transportation that may uh, have lower incomes, et cetera? How do we ensure that those communities are, uh, are able to benefit from a plan like this? Yeah, thank you, Marco. And, you know, as a reminder, when we think about infrastructure and equity, caregiving hasn't been central to that conversation historically. And what we know is that the federal government has a tremendous amount of leverage to make sure that our taxpayer dollars are going to support good living wage jobs where people can join unions, not poverty wage jobs that force people to use public assistance. So the American Jobs Plan I feel is an opportunity not just to create more jobs, it's an incredible opportunity to also create better jobs. And it also means thinking, it's really interesting, you know, $400 billion is what this plan calls for in investing in, in the caregiving infrastructure, which is a part of the non-traditional infrastructure as part of the plan. So it really forces us to think beyond physical infrastructure and investing in job enabling jobs, right? just as roads and bridges help people get to work, care work is infrastructure that makes all of the other work possible. We know that care work gets seniors and people with disabilities that's the support that they need to live with dignity and independence at their home and in their communities. And that it's also the foundation of our economy, right? No one can do their job if their loved ones aren't cared for. And President Biden's investment in particular in home care workers is the first jobs program focused on a workforce that is primarily driven by women of color, many of them Latinas, women who were excluded from basic rights and labor protections for decades because of systemic racism. So it has the ability to truly transform not only their lives, but their family lives and their entire communities, both in red or blue states and urban and rural environments and in every single zip code across this country. So investing in long-term care infrastructure is going to allow millions of workers, most of them women, to return to their careers and create up to a million new family sustaining jobs for a workforce, again, that is predominantly uh, people of color. So I think that's incredibly exciting and, and also very important. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Arnulfo. And, and now let's go to you, Ashley, and let's let's hear from you in terms of uh, some of the, the priorities in the areas you talked about that Amazon is, is particularly focusing on. Um, what are the what are the areas that you see uh, this bill helping to address? So it sounds like we are going to be in strong agreement across the board on supporting the Biden administration's focus on making these bold investments in American infrastructure. And that's great to hear. Um, the focus on the on climate change and environmental justice in the American Jobs Plan will help ensure that communities that have been overlooked by federal investment in the past will benefit from this spending, and that's a very important point. Um, the, that includes transportation investments that focus on connecting communities with jobs through targeted transit projects and clean energy funds to help address pollution in frontline communities, as Secretary Buttigieg mentioned. And of course, the president's plan includes crucial support for electric cars and trucks, uh, substantial investments for broadband infrastructure and funding to repair roads and bridges. Um, we're also happy to see that the president included investments in human infrastructure. We support the plan's efforts to expand access to apprenticeships and computer science education, for example, and its programs to connect underrepresented students to high-tech employers. Um, I, I also want to mention that we recognize these solutions will require concessions from all sides, and we're supportive of a rise in the corporate tax rate to help pay for those investments. I know that's a, a conversation that continues to happen on the Hill, and we want to be a part of that. Uh, bottom line, 
any comprehensive infrastructure bill that enhances U.S. competitiveness has to include robust investments of communities in color, and that's what we're interested in working on. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Leo, share your perspective. Sure. Uh, look, broadband is is in a lot, in so many ways one of the one of the main things that consistently comes up in these conversations when it comes to infrastructure and how things are going to be prioritized. Uh, just last week, for for low income individuals, uh, you know the and the FCC should be applauded for this. Congress passed three point two billion dollars for an emergency broadband fund, and the FCC. Uh, props to them in record time, actually executed the order within 60 days with a 2-2 commission. Uh, so congratulations to them for that. Uh, you know, the program's been out there for a week. It offers low-income families, uh, you know, $50 towards the cost of their service. Um, if you're on tribal lands, it's 75 um, The way that program works right now is, is you know, it, it kind of, the the individual applies and then the benefit comes uh, in the shape of a reimbursement to the companies. We think that moving forward that, that you know, it should be explored whether that fund possibly should be made permanent and, and, and the benefit should be put in the hands of individuals so that they can decide who their carrier is. Many people in our community, as you know, uh, have uh, more transient lives, right? If they're farm workers, they're in different places at different times of year. Uh, you know, we, we have a, a community that that uh, tends to be more mobile. Um, so we need to look at those types of things for low income individuals on the deployment side. Uh, I, I really think that the, the president has has uh, hit the hit the nail on the head there. One hundred million, one hundred billion dollars to uh, deploy broadband infrastructure in this com in this country uh, can go a long way. Um, and what we, from what we know in past experiences with programs on connectivity, is that even with a hundred billion dollars out there, there does need to be some sort of, uh, you know, guidance provided as to possibly where those funds should go first and what the priorities are. I know that there are a lot of conversations happening with the White House and within Congress on how that should uh, on how that should happen, uh, but we're here to you know, be as supportive and, and give our experiences, uh, you know, uh, apply our experience to, to those conversations so we can be helpful. Thank you, Leo. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because in fact, cheating ahead, I'm noticing that, that there are a couple of questions already in the queue for when we get to the Q&A that, that talk about this digital infrastructure. So, and, and, and I wanted to make a note uh, even before that to, to mention this emergency broadband benefit that, as you mentioned, just, just uh, came about, uh, was was executed last week. So um, I wanted to dig a little deeper on that and see if, if Congressman Carvajal, if you had any thoughts on that, since you, I'm sure, weighed in on on voting for that. Um, uh, how do you see that benefiting Latino communities? Are there any things we should be watching? Is there any is there anything we should be on guard about to ensure that our communities, that all communities um, that truly need this access are able to take advantage of the program? Certainly. Well, uh, going back to the Consolidated Appropriation Act of 2021 that yes. we passed in, in, in uh, December of last year with uh, then the American Rescue Plan and now the American uh, Jobs Plan, there's been a number of investments that have been made in the broadband connectivity um, area to make sure schools have the ability uh, to provide uh, subsidies or tablets or um, hotspots so that we could expand connectivity. I will tell you in my district, uh, there's one example. There was the Martinez family was going from public area to public area to get connected so that their children could do the their homework. Uh, that's unsatisfactory and inexcusable. And like uh, Leo mentioned, uh, we need to make sure that the funding that we include in the American Jobs Act gets equitably and prioritized to those areas and communities that need it the most, that are most impacted, that have the highest disparity. Because if not, it's gonna be business as usual. So I think in Congress, we're, we're moving forward with a, a framework that provides for as much equity as possible, but then it's gonna be tagged. The White House has to then take the baton and make sure that it's implemented. 
in a way that has the guardrails, that has the rulemaking, that has all the things that need to happen so that there is true equity at the forefront of everything we do in rolling out these investments. Uh, but, you know, it's as a Latino and, and, and as advocates for uh, the Latino community, status quo is usually not as equitable for the Latino community and the have nots. And we need to make sure that we are being more aggressive in raising these equity and disparity issues and demanding that nobody gets left behind. And enough is enough. The Latino community needs to be included. For that much, any community that has been left out needs to be included. And I think we just need to make sure that the White House uh, now, um, once we move forward to this very important piece of legislation, takes the baton and imp implements it in a way that is most equitable. Thank you for that. And, and I wanna note that, that as Leo mentioned, um, this is something, as I understand it, that's somewhat temporary, right? It's an emergency broadband benefit. Um, and so I think, again, that as we think about traditionally our communities access to broadband, this is something that 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 one of the pieces I've heard that folks are, are, are looking to is is trying to ensure how to ensure that broad and perhaps the investments that, that you both have mentioned, um, the longer term building out of the infrastructure may and ensuring that's equitable may help to address some of these problems that that in some ways were chronic and were really just highlighted, right, as a result of the pandemic. And that again, if this benefit is temporary, then it, we may go back to, to our communities having less access than their peers uh, if a support like this isn't continued, right? When, when, when people feel like the economy is quote unquote back to normal, uh, as we know, the economy hasn't always benefited our community. So I don't know if anybody had thoughts to, to add on that perspective. Marco, just real quick, I don't want to take all the time on this on this topic, but it's an important one. We have we found during the pandemic that we took our low income program that was really targeted to households. And then during the pandemic, we expanded that to partner with school districts and nonprofits and foundations and do some uh, we call it the Internet Essentials uh, partnership program to where we could go try to connect swaths of neighborhoods in certain school districts where the community identified need, right? To, to Congressman Carbajal's point, they were saying, hey, we're, we're, we're hearing the stories of these families that are trying to go around and find, you know, the, the appropriate hotspots or what have you. And we, of course, opened up our hotspots as many of our competitors did uh, during the pandemic to the public. Um, but really the, the really important part of all this is there's going to have to be some community involvement to your point from not just our third party partners in the Latino community, but our community partners in the Latino community to help everyone identify the needs. Because in our experience, providing Internet service to low income families, the we are the most successful for the partnerships and the level of engagement with the community is the strongest. And that's and that's something that's going to need to permeate throughout this through, throughout this effort to get everyone connected. That's great. That's great. And, and one last If I could just add, oh yeah, if sure. I could just add, don't forget this goes beyond education as well. It's not only for businesses, but telemedicine, telehealth. Uh, we saw how important it was to expand yeah. capability of outreach uh, to low-income communities or rural communities. So. Um, getting people connected, getting infrastructure, broadband infrastructure in place is going to help us uh, reach and provide access to all of those uh, sectors and communities. Absolutely. And, and actually, I was about to I go to you. applaud oh, Comcast and other cable companies. Uh, I, I certainly did not mean to insinuate that they didn't step up. They're doing what they have to do. They make money, but they're also stepping up and, and being good partners with, with uh, communities. But we as, as government, I think, is what I was referencing. We need to make sure that the investments are made to really provide the connectivity and the, address the equity issues that exist. Absolutely. We need both the public and the private sectors, I think, uh, uh, working hand in hand in this. And so actually, I was going to go to you before we switch gears on this, because I, I believe Amazon has has made some real efforts, some commitments uh, to this, and not just because it should be noted. I suspect your business model may uh, benefit a little from having better broadband access, but also because, again, I think as a good corporate citizen, you all see the value of all these other benefits that having access provides. That's right. 
everyone benefits when when broadband is more readily accessible. We do, Comcast does, more importantly, um, our communities do, our, our school children do. And so that is the, the, the shared goal I think we all have. And expanding access and affordability of broadband has always been a priority for Amazon, but um, really has only um, uh, intensified during the pandemic. Um, a much higher percentage of white families use home broadband internet than black or Latino families contributing to the so-called homework gap that truly has been exacerbated by the pandemic. In fact, um, one study found that children in one out of three black, Latino, or Native American households do not have broadband access. And so we strongly support efforts by Congress and the Federal Communications Commission to address that homework gap and provide connectivity and services to support uh, remote learning. Um, much like Leo was referring to earlier, Earlier, we have likewise found that partnering with communities to provide access has been a successful short-term solution. For example, we recently partnered with the city of Oakland and Oakland Undivided to deliver 1,300 new touchscreen devices for students and students with special needs. Um, that's because at the start of the pandemic, Oakland Undivided surveyed students and found that only 12% of students from low-income backgrounds were connected with a computer and internet access. And now access has increased to 98% across all demographics. And wow. that is that is huge. So that that is working, but long-term, another example of our commitment is to expanding broadband access is Project Hyper, which is Amazon's low earth orbit satellite broadband project mm. that will deliver broadband to underserved and unserved communities uh, in the U.S. and around the world. So we're excited about the benefits it will provide to our customers and the opportunities it's going to create for small businesses and services like online education and um, also, very importantly, telehealth. That's great. And I'm glad you ended on that, that point about telehealth because, Arnulfo, I want to get you in on this conversation. We've talked a lot about, even as we've, I would argue, even as we've talked about different aspects, not the traditional aspect of infrastructure, roads, bridges, and ports, I would argue we've still talked in some ways about the equipment, right? It, it's now broadband we're talking about and, and even the software or, or the access, I should say, uh, uh, the virtual access. But there is a human component to this entire uh, puzzle, right? There's a there's an aspect of, of this infrastructure plan that has a human component. And, and again, one of the things we've known, sadly, much like we just talked about in terms of broadband access, in terms of, of impact on families and children, um, there's also been, uh, based on inequitable application sometimes, uh, of various different types of services that are now being described as part of the overall infrastructure plan, um, some of our communities have not necessarily benefited as much. Um, and so I wonder in particular, maybe to start, for example, um, uh, there is a component, I think, of this infrastructure plan that will have an impact on seniors. Right, that if if I understand right, SEIU 2015 uh, uh, works with with workers who who support uh, our senior community. So, what are some of the the aspects of the plan you see that are going to benefit seniors? And similarly, are there any things we need to be watching out for that we need to make sure that that there's strong advocacy for to ensure equitable and beneficial application for communities? Yeah, that's uh, excellent point, Marcos. Thank you for for flagging that. And I think. You know, this is these are issues that are really a constant daily reminder of concern for our members. There's an intimate relationship between a caregiver and those that they care for, many of them seniors and people with disabilities, and the conditions and the communities where they work and live. And for caregivers, the community also involves, the community is the workplace, right? The goal of their work is to ensure that the recipients can fully participate as seniors in their community and older adults who have difficulties maybe walking or those who don't drive, they're really less likely and kind of more socially isolated compared to those without some of those mobility limitations. So it makes it important that things like parks, flexible transit, disability accessible infrastructure, that all of those find their way into historically overlooked communities, as you mentioned. And people with disabilities we know also travel less frequently, right? They rely much more on public transportation more than the general population. So we estimate that about a half a million people in the United States actually don't leave home because they have difficulties around transportation. So all of these issues are very much connected and these issues obviously um, are, are much more heightened in communities that have been historically overlooked 
such as the Latino community. And if you think about the care piece, we know that over 10,000 adults are turning 65 every day and that the demand for home and community-based care is at an all-time high and that the aging population in the United States is also becoming much more diverse, right? We estimate that between 2015 and 2060, the number of black older adults will nearly triple across the country and the number of Latino older adults will more than quintuple. So this patchwork that we have of underfunded, you know, Medicaid programs has really forced family members to leave the workforce, many of them women, to provide unpaid care and many aging adults and people with disabilities have to forego the services and the supports that they're really badly needing. So what the care plan does is it really increases funding that helps to address, it has the potential to address racial and ethnic disparities in home and community-based services, but also an additional infrastructure such as training, right? All of us are gonna need someone to care for our loved ones or ourselves eventually. We want caregivers who are trained, who are well-paid, um, making sure that they're caring for our loved ones. So these, this plan invests to the tune of 400 billion in the aging uh, care infrastructure that we have in this country, which is incredibly exciting because again, as you point out, Marco, all of these issues are very intimately related. Thank you. Thank you. And Ashley, I wanna go back to you for a second because in addition to uh, uh, providing the, the incredible services that, that, that you all do, you're also a pretty large employer, right? There's quite a bit, and you have impact on the workforce, both in terms of your employees, as well as contractors and, 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 and third-party vendors, right? And not to mention suppliers, et cetera. So I'm wondering, um, what do you see as part of this bill? And, and again, what are the things we need to make sure to keep an eye out for in terms of either equitable distribution and or a positive benefit and impact on the workforce, many of whom uh, I suspect are, are, are represented uh, by Latino communities, other communities of color, low-income communities, et cetera. What are the pieces that, that you all at Amazon are watching for, are pushing for, are, are, are supportive of that will impact your workforce? So that's right. As, as the nation's second largest employer, Amazon has more than 800,000 employees in the U.S., 300 of which I'm proud to say are in Congressman Carvajal's district. And um, most of our employees are essential workers who cannot work from home. And so we're proud of the work they have done to deliver for customers during this pandemic. Um, it, we, I spoke to a little of um, our priorities and what we see is um, as far as the the administration's focus on making these bold investments, whether it is broadband infrastructure, whether it's funding to repair our roads. Um, you know, Amazon, in order to deliver for customers, we are investing in our own transportation network, whether it's building airports and investing in airports across the United States, purchasing truck trailers and hiring small and medium sized businesses to help move them, uh, or creating um, or working with small business entrepreneurs who create delivery companies to deliver for us. In fact, last year we announced a diversity grant to help reduce barriers to entry for Black, Latino, and Native American entrepreneurs. But that uh, presumes that we have a transportation network that works. And so we do need to make these bold investments in order for to keep our economy moving. And so we we look forward to, to partnering with the administration, with the Congressman Carvajal and the Transportation Infrastructure committee to make sure that these investments are are um, the right ones that they're ensuring that communities of color are supported and that um, much and that we are considering transit how employees get to and from work so that they have safe routes that they can make it to these these jobs and um, those are the types of things we're keeping top of mind as, as this bill continues to move that's great. Thank you. And now, Leo, I want to ask you also, uh, Comcast is a pretty large employer, so I'm sure you've, you've thought about this from the workforce perspective. But also, if I could, if, if you would also share with us a little bit, I'm sure, I'm sure you're following this closely. Uh, you're a policy expert uh, in your own right. Um, there is talk already, clearly, uh, as the conversations continue, that, that this bill may ultimately, when passed, um, 
be less than the 2.3 trillion uh, originally proposed, right? And so I wonder if, in fact, that is something that ends up getting contemplated. What are, do you think are the key priorities that we need to make sure are not left out? What are the kinds of things that, for the Latino community, um, folks should be thinking about, watching for to ensure uh, is at least uh, represented in in some sort of final version of a bill? Right. Well, just take it. So, from from a purely Latino community perspective, I think a lot of the things that, that Congressman Carvajal alluded to that are not necessarily the, the hard infrastructure dollars that we think of, right? Pavement, roads, bridges, fiber, cable, those things, but the, but the sweeping changes that the White House has proposed as far as social structure that, that Arnulfo has, has uh, alluded to as well. I think that, you know, those are the types of things that help our, the people in our community, right? There's a lot of, a lot of folks use, you know, when your kids are not in school, we know that our families tend to use school is where you, you keep your kids safe during the day when, when you're going to work, right? And uh, it's interesting because we were, we were having an, an internal conversation about some of the analysis we're trying to do on some of the lift zones we've done in schools, you know, these Wi-Fi central mm. spot. And, and I was telling them, it'd be really good to know, like, you know, in certain communities, how, you know, how, how close is the lift zone to a big community center or a big school? Because I don't know about, you know, other panelists, but like, I know where I grew up, it was like, mom was working, you had to walk, you had to walk you and, and my brother and my friend down the street to the library or, or, or wherever the after school program was or, or wherever we were going to be taken care of after school, right? While, while mom was at work, right? And that's just the, that's just a simple fact of, of life for people, not just in our community and other lower income, middle income communities, but it's, it's, it's the things like that, 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 that uh that are being proposed to try to ease you know child care preschool all these things you know that where the research and the data has shown us you know pre preschool's insanely important for the for the for the future success of a student period i mean there's mm -hmm. you know you can't refute the data so th the things like that are going to be i think more impactful to the Lat latino community as a whole don't get me wrong we need all the all the roads and the bridges and and the broadband, all, all of that is critical as well. But I, I do think that from a from a Latino community perspective, that that's that investment and and kind of the social aspects of, of what's going on is gonna be really interesting and I think critical to a lot of families who are trying to you know, work, work their, you know, put their, put their kids in a better place. Right. I mean, for lack of a better term, I think those things are going to be really important. That's great. That's great. All right. We're, we're about to get into uh, some audience Q and A. So if you folks, if you haven't already submitted your questions, be sure to add them. Um, but I want to finish up back with Congressman Carvajal. Um, I wanted to see if you had any thoughts to add to, to the panelists comments. Um, as we think about the workforce, right? As we think about, we've talked about families, we've talked about schools, but I wanted to see if there, if you had any thoughts to add again, as we think about this infrastructure plan and the, the implications for the Latino segment of the workforce, the Latino communities where there are, there have been both essential workers has been mentioned. And, and it must be said also, I think we haven't talked about that even for some of these uh, traditional um, um, infrastructure projects as roads, bridges, building, construction, et cetera, um, housing that we've been talked about is going to be added. There's a significant portion of the Latino community who are part of those workforces, right? And so that has potential economic benefits. But I wonder if, again, is there anything we need to be watching out for, to be aware of, to be raising our voices to ensure that Latinos are able to, to, to benefit equitably? Well, absolutely. You know, uh, I know somebody, I think it might have been you that mentioned that it might not be $2.3 trillion dollars. It might be less due to compromises, and that's fine. But I think this is a comprehensive bill, and we need to really keep an eye on all the things that are high priority. You know, um, Leo mentioned about many low-income families and children end up walking to school. Uh, well, let's not forget that there's safe routes to school, how to make routes safer for children 
in low income neighborhoods so that when they do walk to school, they're at least in a safe uh, path, not in, in harm's way, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, we just need to make sure that if the bill is reduced in, in, in price tag, that it doesn't really leave out a lot of the high priorities, or maybe it just comes down equally as a, as a price tag, but doesn't start leaving out programs because they're also valuable. Uh, certainly we can prioritize some things over other things, but I think that it's extremely important. And in, besides investing in our infrastructure and modernizing it, this is about creating jobs and making sure that when we uh, distribute the money that we are helping disadvantaged businesses, minority and women businesses, so that everybody is benefiting from this, not only from jobs, but business opportunities. And I know we're talking about the American Jobs Plan and infrastructure, but let's not forget the American Families Plan and Families Act that's coming. And that I think goes even above and beyond and does what our Nulfo was talking about, invest in our human infrastructure in so many ways. And that plan, uh, you know, it's gonna be an investment that like no other investment that we've seen in recent decades, because this pandemic has shown the need for us to continue to lift up our economy and in doing so address some of the disparities and inequities that have developed over, over the years. Uh, the wage uh, disparities. We are at a point where we need to bring ourselves up as a country and invest in so many areas that we have neglected over the years to bring up working middle-class families so that they can have a better shot at the American dream. So uh, the, the American Jobs Act is one thing, but we have the American Families Plan that's coming as well. And together, these are gonna be huge investments in really lifting people up, uh, addressing poverty in one of the most significant ways ever in our country for children. Uh, th these are great investments. And I think we just need to continue to be mindful and involved uh, with everyone to make sure that they're implemented in the most equitable fashion. Uh, let me just say that I am so grateful that Ashley, Arnulfo, and Leo are out there in their sectors and their organizations and their companies uh, making sure that equity issues are front and center. So I applaud them for who they are and what they're doing in their own individual organizations. Absolutely. I, I agree completely. Um, thank you for that. All right, so now we're going to jump into the t some of the audience Q and A, and and let me start with the first question that was that was submitted pretty early. That I imagine, um, uh, if it wasn't already on people's minds, certainly will be uh, of interest for folks to hear. Um, so last week, you know, as if we didn't have enough already to deal with, we had an interesting sort of twist, uh, unexpected new thing, which was the the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack, right? That that arguably wreaked havoc in a whole new way um, on, on our economy and on our infrastructure, right? And, and, and fo forced us to look in a new way, for example, in terms of our cybersecurity um, and protecting our, our, our infrastructure. Um, what are some of the efforts that you think um, are needed to, to address the vulnerabilities, whether it be from in terms of the government side or in terms of private industry? What are the things we need to do to ensure that we don't have future either colonial pipeline uh, uh, ransomware attacks on the, on the pipeline or in other sort of critical uh, uh, supports and, and systems in our country? Was that for me, Marcos? Uh, for all of you, anybody who wants to jump in, so feel free. <laughs> well, you know, certainly we've seen uh, a number of uh, cyber attacks over the years, and we need to do better as a country. Uh, I know the private sector is, is working diligently from their perspective to safeguard their interests, but I think we as a government need to do better. Uh, from I sit on the House Armed Services Committee, and certainly from a national security standpoint, we have invested and continue to invest in expanding our capabilities to not only um, thwart efforts like that on our uh, institutions and on vulnerable uh, functions in our country, but also to uh, start developing international rules of conduct and, and going after bad actors that are doing this. Uh, but, you know, just, we don't have, um, just like in the nuclear world, uh, we need to have uh, certain rules of, of interaction uh, as it relates uh, to cyber. And we need to go after those that are committing these types of crimes. Uh, so we should do better in investing in our capabilities to counter these types of efforts. 
That's great. Thank you. Is there anything the private sector can do, other panelists? Yep. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. I completely agree that um, the cyber attacks like the ones launched against Colonial Pipeline have the potential to devastate our economy, and we saw that with the repercussions that happened. Um, you know, the president has an executive order that takes important steps to ensure that um, the U.S. can continue to modernize these IT systems and protect against future threats. Um, of course, part of Amazon is Amazon Web Services, and that security is their number one priority. And I would just say that we stand ready to support the Biden administration as it works with the private sector to bolster the country's cyber security defenses and to work with government to create um, a system that ensures everyone is protected. So I appreciate the congressman's remarks and, and we do want to partner with government to help make this uh, more robust. Great, thank you. Yeah, um, Mark, I would, oh, I would just say, our, our, look, we're, one of the nation's largest internet ISPs, right? So we're, our network, trust me, it is, it is, it is under attack right now as we speak, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's just a fact of, 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 of what this digital economy and the reliance on, on data <laughs> and communicating over these extremely fast networks in practically real time uh, has th that's just the fact of life where we live. So it's it's important from a private sector uh, perspective to you know be able to share best practices. I know we have people on our team, both regulatory and in cyber, that, that communicate regularly with the appropriate agencies in the federal government to to make sure that that you know things are being communicated and best practices are being looked at and because it's it's a constant i mean it is a just just a constant you know challenge to uh to stay ahead but it's it's critically important to stay ahead because uh you know it's from a business perspective you want people to trust uh you know that their data is 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 safe um and from a national security perspective yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, you see what happened in, in my, the state I grew up in was is Texas. Um, what happened with a, just a, a super hard freeze at the, you know, at the wrong time of year, right? So yeah. there are a lot of things that need to be looked at. But we, like Ashley said, we're happy to work with, with Congress and the appropriate authorities to do whatever we can to make sure things stay safe. That's great. That's great. Thank you. All right. So uh, another question here from one of our audience members. Um, how will the American Jobs Plan address uh, inefficiencies or insufficiencies in affordable housing and equitable development? That's something I know we've we've seen certainly in communities, right, that, that the, the lack of available affordable housing, et cetera. Are there parts contemplated in the, the American uh, uh, Jobs Plan that that address housing? Absolutely. Uh, Go ahead. Was somebody else going to say something? No, no. I was, go ahead, Congressman. Yep. I was going to say whoever wants to jump in. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, we made sure uh, today that housing was not left out. Uh, the, the three components that were uh, made more robust beyond traditional infrastructure uh, was in the area of housing, schools, and, and broadband. Um, not that broadband isn't mainstream, but somehow it's always included as, a, as, a, as an item at the end. But um, certainly, there's robust funding for uh, incentivizing and promoting more housing, uh, affordable housing, uh, to be exact. That's great. That's great. I don't know if anybody else had any comments, or I can go on to the next question. All right. Um, here's one. I, I wonder if you all have, a, have an opinion or perspective on. Um, someone mentioned, for example, that we saw with the Flint lead poisoning of water issue, that local government didn't necessarily respond uh, as quickly as, as many would have liked. It's an issue that sort of dragged on, I think, far too long, uh, impacting the local residents of, of Flint. And so the question is, um, how can communities depend on local government uh, around issues like their health um, as we think about sort of this infrastructure, uh, these infrastructure needs and as we move forward? Is there, is, are there thoughts about how local government can be more effective and or ways that there, there can be investments in local government to help maybe uh, mitigate those issues? 
And again, anyone this is on the, the panel. only government <laughs> guy. Let me dive in. Uh, <laughs> having served in local government, uh, certainly local government has the responsibility uh, for the health and safety of its residents. And we learn from every uh, situation like Flint uh, as a country uh, as to what to do, what not to do, how prompt are we in responding, how effective we are. And certainly uh, they did certain things really well and certain things they could uh, they would do different if, if they did it all over again. Uh, certainly also the United States government, EPA, had a role here. And um, I can't speak as to how effective or not effective they were, but all I know is that it was a fluid situation. And I think everybody learned from that situation, hopefully uh, from the federal government to the local government, uh, to see how we could better respond to those situations in the future. But the best response is prevention. So we need to look at that situation to see how uh, we could have avoided that contamination develop as it did in Flint, uh, to avoid those types of situations throughout the county. And the way you do that is taking proactive steps, uh, regulatory steps, uh, if they're not available, and if they're available, making sure that they're being implemented appropriately so that communities, uh, health and public safety is number one and adhere to. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I'm wondering if someone oh, wants to ahead. jump in, I'm thinking, oh, go ahead, Leo. Yep. No, I was just going to say, piggybacking on, on what the congressman said, I, in, in, a, in a previous life, I did work for a, a few local elected officials and on the state level as well. And uh, one, one thing I think that, that our formal, former local elected officials who are now in Congress definitely have perspective on, like Congressman Carbajal, Congresswoman Norma Torres, Sylvia Garcia. There are a lot, there are a lot of CHC mm -hmm. members, frankly, that served on the local level is you know you're going to see a, a, a potentially massive influx of dollars for a tremendous amount of work and different streams of infrastructure all of them requiring some sort of permitting by the local government authorities and i don't know that there's an influx of money coming to the cities or counties to help beef up the personnel that are going to be required to deal with the influx of permitting uh requests and and uh and stress frankly that, that's coming coming their way uh and I'm, and that's just really me just speaking as somebody who's like from the comcast side we work a lot with local governments on permitting issues and things like that um but i, th I think it's something that people aren't really talking a whole lot about, but I could see that potentially being an issue for some, you know, for some localities throughout the country. That's great. Marco, I, I was just going to add briefly, yeah. what, what a great, what a great question, right? Because this question illustrates where equity and infrastructure intersect. And as a young boy growing up in the Central Valley in California, we were dealing at that time with a lot of issues around pesticides in the water. Mm -hmm. the community that was in Flint, there's a community like that in every zip code across the country. And I think where you have responsive local elected officials, and then we had an executive board meeting in Detroit. We sent some of the home care workers to work with the community groups on the ground in Flint. We had bought all of this bottled water, and I thought to myself, there's so much more that could be done, but I think the organizing on the ground, not being afraid to lift up your voice when you see that something's wrong, and you have elected officials like our congressman right here on the line with us, there's so much that you can do together in a situation like that. So, yeah, I just thought I would add that. Thanks, Marco. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I think maybe we've got time for one final audience question here. Um, Let's talk a little bit about, um, here's one that ha we haven't, uh, I think, talked as much about. Um, there is a component as we think about this, certainly in terms of, of the idea of if some or all of these projects and these investments pass, there will be a, a significant increase in, in the number of, uh, uh, of workers engaging in these projects. So I'm wondering, are there um, measures contemplated in the, in the plan or are there recommendations 
you all have, again, based on even on your industries and your organizations, about ensuring safety of workers? That's a question I think that came up in terms of how do we ensure the safety of the workers who end up uh, 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 implementing these infrastructure projects? Any thoughts? Well, part of that also falls on state um, OSHA type guidelines. You know, there's national and state, and every mm -hmm. state has different guidelines. I'm proud to be from California. We have pretty robust worker protections. We can always do better, but uh, I think we have worker protections. But not just for the workers uh, implementing a lot of these projects. I will tell you, there's also a lot of safety uh, standards and funding for safety on mm -hmm. highways and roads uh, in the American Jobs Act as part of the HR2 component that was added. Uh, because when you think about the moving public, it's a great part mm -hmm. about safety. And oftentimes, those that depend on certain modes of transportation, uh, be it safe route through school walking, whether it's public transportation, whether it's vehicles, making sure automobiles are implementing the right type of, of, of technologies and are incentivized to do so. Uh, the American Jobs Plan is, uh, I think, provides a little bit of all of that, uh, not only for those that will be implementing the actual infrastructure projects, but the, the public that is going to benefit keeping safety in mind. Great, great. Thank you. Well, and I believe, Congressman, you're being called. Um, you're being called out. You have to jump off. So I don't know if there's any final words you had to say before you head off. But we certainly want to thank you for being here. No, I just want to thank you and CHCI and uh, my fellow panelists uh, for all that you do day in and day out to keep these important public policy issues at the forefront, especially equity issues. Uh, you know, this is about addressing disparities and making sure that everyone in our country, no matter of background uh, or economic status, has a shot at the American dream. And we all do it together. So thank you for inviting me today. Thank you, sir. We appreciate having you here. And uh, uh, and we'll go on to our, our the rest of our panel, which, in fact, that's what I was going to do is ask you all if you have any final closing comments, if you want to talk about this safety, uh, this, this last safety question and or wrap in together your any closing remarks you have, which one way to think about is what uh, final thought would you like to leave our audience with as, as we think about this uh, infrastructure plan as it continues moving through uh, the halls of government? Uh, oh, sorry, I should call on somebody, huh? Let's start with you, Arnulfo. <laughs> Great, thank you, Marco. And I really appreciate you facilitating this incredible conversation, so important. You know, as I had mentioned earlier, what excites me most is I feel like we do have this once in a generation opportunity through President Biden's American Jobs Plan to really create the most racially diverse, most resilient middle class that our country has ever seen. Uh, we feel strongly that a piece of that, and this gets to the point around safety, I think, you know, if you ask the workers themselves, what are the tools that they need to be safe at work? I'm going to I'm gonna give you a story of a nursing home worker. When you think of safety, maybe um, we go to, right, construction, uh, public, but it, uh, being a nursing home worker in the last 12 months was a pretty dangerous job, right? We had uh, nursing home workers who were going to work with no uh, PPE, no gloves, they didn't have masks, they were having to use stuff at home. And in some cases, half of the facility had tested positive during the pandemic. So really, I think around safety, making sure that workers' voices, that they have the ability to join a union, they have ability to talk about what are some of the tools that they need to be safe. And I just really appreciate that this plan is investing in America's home care workforce. It's a critical step towards creating a society and an economy where all working people have a real shot at opportunity without any ex exceptions. And this would be an economic game changer for the millions and millions of women, Latina, African-American, AAPI, white, who care for our children and elders and people with disabilities so that they're able to get the care that they need so that they can also work. So this $400 billion investment in our nation's essential care infrastructure is, is remarkable. Now we're just going to make sure that we're doing our work, Marco, to ensure its passage and continue to lift up our voices. So again, really happy to be on and appreciate this opportunity. Great. Thank you. And Leo, let's go to you. Thank you, Marco. I uh, would just say, I think that we, we truly are, as Arnulfo said, we're in a once in a, in a generation 
opportunity here to truly connect every American to the internet. And uh, we, we think that that can be done, uh, but it's going to need to be done thoughtfully and, and with some, some strategy, right? Some sort of guidelines as to where, where we go uh, to make sure that especially our rural communities are connected. Um, and also to make sure that those in urban centers where oftentimes, you know, the, the lines running down the street, that they, that they have the ability to afford and get access to, to broadband. But just thank, thanks to you and to all the panelists for this opportunity today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And Ashley, let's give you the, la the final word. So on the safety piece, I do want to talk about that briefly because it is so important and the health and safety of our employees is our number one priority and we've invested billions in employee protections, particularly around the, the COVID-19 pandemic and keeping our workers safe, whether it's was mm. building um, a first and class testing program from scratch or now where we're partnering with uh, healthcare providers to provide on-site vaccination events to um, vaccinate our frontline employees. And you know, eliminating barriers to vaccination and making vaccine access easy and convenient for employees um, is how we continue to tackle this pandemic and why we support the Biden administration's efforts to ensure vaccination rates continue to increase, that testing becomes widespread and affordable. And we're doing our part to help with both both of those objectives. Um, just to wrap up quickly, though, I, I want to echo my fellow panelists' comments and thank you for holding this important conversation. We all agree it's time to make these bold investments in infrastructure. Um, the focus on climate change and environmental justice in the American Jobs Plan will help ensure that communities that have been frankly overlooked by federal investment in the past will benefit from this spending, and so that any comprehensive infrastructure bill that enhances U.S. competitiveness uh, has to include robust investments in uh, um, communities of color, and we look forward to being a part of that effort. So thank you again and to CHCI for including me today. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I want to thank each of you, our extraordinary panelists, for this thought-provoking discussion. I want to thank Congressman Salud Carvajal, who, who, if you're just joining us, had to, had to leave. Um, but I also want to thank you, Ashley De La Torre, Arnulfo De La Cruz, and Leo Munoz. It's been a really, I think, insightful, thoughtful conversation, and we really appreciate both the comments you made and the work. As the Congressman said, I want to echo the work that you are all doing as leaders uh, in your companies, in your organizations, in your communities uh, to help ensure equity uh, and progress, frankly, for, for the entire nation. So appreciate all of you, and, uh, uh, and thanks for being here with us, you three. And finally, I want to thank each and every one of you all for joining us at this year's CHCI Spring Policy Summit. Uh, I want to once more thank our host sponsor, Amazon, as well as all the corporate, labor, nonprofit, and advocacy partners, as well as members of the media who joined us, uh, in addition to the many members of Congress uh, who gave remarks throughout the day. Uh, it's been a long day for some of us, but we covered a vast majority of topics, a vast number of topics that we think matter most. Everything from tackling this climate crisis that we continue to live through, thinking how we prepare the Latino workforce through this recovery, helping to ensure equity in health and vaccine distribution, democratizing, investing, and thinking about retirement for the Latino community, and the thing that matters most to so many individuals and families as we come out of this global pandemic, ensuring good, fair, and decent paying jobs for every American. As you reflect on this and all the conversations we've had today, please keep telling us what you thought about this summit by responding to our survey, which will pop up right at the end of this session, but also by tweeting about your reactions to the summit, sharing your highlights using the hashtag CHCI Summit. You can tweet, you can Instagram, you can make a TikTok video. All of it is welcome. It's important feedback to help us ensure we continue to do a good job. Uh, and speaking of doing a good job, before we close, I have to take a moment to thank the incredibly hardworking and brilliant, frankly, CHCI staff team who did all the very, very heavy lifting of putting all of the pieces together for this event to take place. Uh, it's been an eventful year and a half, but they, as, as hopefully you all will agree, they've become really, really adept at putting together these virtual events and ensuring that no, that there's no loss of insight 
of, of perspective, of benefit to our community in terms of having these conversations and tackling these really difficult issues. Uh, I'm grateful for all of their efforts and I'm frankly honored to be a part uh, of that team. So with that, we bring today's session and today's summit to a close. Thank you all for being here with us. Have a good evening and as always, be safe and healthy.